good stuff. Yeah, the one relatively apposite thing that I forgot to mention actually was the fact that I'm also a board member of the Cornwall Birdwatching and Preservation Society, which is obviously relevant in, in the context of the talk. Um, and obviously, in, in, given my background, my main input to that is um, as a conservation officer to get involved in various planning applications and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, that's who I am. So, um, welcome to the Lizard Peninsula. So, I don't know, many of you probably would have been to Corn Cornwall at some time in your lives, but uh, whether or not you've been to the Lizard Peninsula, I don't know. It's um, the most southerly point in mainland Britain. The Scilly Isles is slightly further south. But um, so this map of um, West Cornwall shows um, where we're talking about. So this is Penzance up here. You can see the marker. Uh, and then Helston is the main town within the um, lizard area. And then this is Falmouth over here. So that's where we are. Um, there is no one definition of what the lizard actually is because it's a peninsula but um it's it's joined to to um, the rest of cornwall so it's almost a peninsula because there is a a rear so one of these drowned valleys which is the helford river which comes all the way up as far as greek here uh, but from there to port levon on the west coast there is uh, there's land so you can you can have lots of debates and we do as bird watchers to what really uh, is the lizard and it's an important thing because the black area is os map 103 and some of us just treat os map 103 as our outer limits um, and there's an importance to that because for example this year there was a roller in this area uh, obviously a, a, a very rare bird uh, there was a pacific golden plover here at Stythians. Um, and I live at Constantine, which is here, which is actually not on the um, lizard in, in this in this sense. Um, and obviously, if, why would I always go south if there's something rare at Stythians? Then I'll go to Stythians. Um, so that's where it is, roughly. Um, and then just to zoom in a bit closer, this is the main area that we we know as the lizard, and really it's it's this area that I'll be talking to you about. So. The area that you're looking at is about, I suppose, a third to a quarter of the size of Anglesey, if that gives you some sort of sense of the scale. So there's quite a lot of quite a lot of um, land to uh, to look at for birds, and quite a diversity of habitats, a, a great diversity of habitats actually, as I'll show you in a minute. Um, and it has an unofficial total of 375 different species of birds, which in its own right would make it one of the highest um, recording areas um, in Britain. Uh, so higher than most counties, just in that small area. And it has um, a massive reputation down here, at least, for turning up rare birds of all sorts. So um, some of the places that I'll mention as we go through the talk, uh, I've already mentioned the Helford River, which is this bit here, which is intertidal. Um, there is um, Lou Pool, which is a wetland here with a sandbar uh, separating it from the sea. There's um, a lake in Helston, which is good for ducks and various things. And then working down the west coast are some of the main places where we look for rare birds. So Kynance Cove, which is uh, right down here. From there, basically down to Lizard itself, Lizard Village, and then along the coast a little bit to a place called Church Cove is really the bit where most of the rare birds um, turn up and where we, we tend to focus our attention. But then inland from that, there are large areas of uh, heathlands. So there's the Lizard Downs, it's the whole of this area here, it's some um, wild heathland. Goonhilly Downs is another uh, big area of heathland, um, National Nature Reserve in its own right. And then up here, we've got all sorts of uh, ancient woodlands. So there's a lot of different habitats to, um, to look at. Um, so this is the very sudden tip of uh, lizards, which is where the sea watching happens. Basically, just by this hut here is where the sea watchers collect most of the time. Um, and it's got a cafe, so it's quite a nice place to uh, retreat to when the weather gets too awful. Um, this pink colour here is um, an invasive um, I can't from, from, from Africa. 
which um, uh, is abundant on this cliff face here uh, because it's relatively frost free, but not, not completely so. And there's the cafe, as I was talking about, that you can sit and um, look out to sea if you want, um, although the sea watching is best looking in the other direction. And if you're lucky when you're sitting there, you'll see a raven displaying in front of you. So this one is turning upside down uh, in front of the cafe and saying hello to us. Um, so just a few of the places that I'll be mentioning as we go through. So this is Kynance Cove, which is one of the um, most famous beauty spots, if you like, on, on the um, peninsula and also has its own cafe, which is rather useful from time to time. Um, there are large areas of heathland, which I mentioned. So this supports breeding species such as Dartford warbler and um, uh, night jars uh, and various other things. Lots of stone chats to, um, to see there. Very good population, had a really good breeding season this year. Um, there's the part of the Helford River with the um, ancient woodlands all the way around it, coming right down to, um, to the shore, really. Uh, this is good for things like green shanks in winter, a lot of green shanks winter down, down here. Common sandpipers, which I think I heard them mentioning earlier on. In the woodlands, obviously things like uh, green woodpecker, although we don't get less spotted down here. Uh, this one was on my lawn uh, a few months back. Long-tailed tits, that sort of thing. Probably like everywhere else, things like marsh tits have become much scarcer. We don't seem to have any tree creepers now. They seem to have gone completely, apart from the occasional, um, well, vagrant, I suppose you'd call them. Um, willow tits non-existent, apart from to very rare occasions. Uh, so yeah, it, in many, in many um, ways that the, the breeding bird populations are, are struggling a bit like they are in, in every part of the country, really. Um, and this is Lou Pool, which I mentioned earlier on, which is the largest body of freshwater on, uh, on the lizard. And it has things like wintering goosander. Uh, it's the only place that you can see them on the lizard. And there are two reasonably large reed beds, which have um, things like Chetty's warbler breeding in them. Uh, occasionally things like wintering bittern. And then an important feature is the coastal grassland, uh, which I'll talk a bit about uh, later on, but um, an important feature of these grasslands is the fact that they are uh, grazed by ponies, which means that they don't turn into scrub and therefore we um, maintain a reasonable sward, uh, which is good for rare plants and good for things like passing wheat ears in spring, of course. So the, the lizard is one of the richest areas in Britain for plants. So um, this is betony and um, Dyer's greenweed and other things growing on the cliff top near Kynance. And basically there are huge areas of grassland which are extremely species rich. It's, it's really a super place in spring and summer for plants as well as for birds. And this area here, although it might look like daisies, it's actually wild chamomile, which smells fantastic. And when you're walking across this, looking for birds in spring and summer, uh, it smells delicious. Uh, it's a great backdrop to birding to know that there are so many wild places. And this is looking out towards um, Wilmer Farm, which is a Cornwall Wildlife um, Trust and um, Cornwall Birdwatching and Preservation Society Reserve. And you can maybe just see the, the windmill here. Uh, which is on the reserve. All of this land is um, protected in one way or another, the whole as far as you can see. Um, great place to go bird watching. Um, if you want to talk about the birds of lizard, I don't think you could start anywhere other than with the chuff really, because they um, are such an important part of um, the backdrop to bird watching on the lizard. So the story here is that they reappeared as if by magic, having become extinct um, early in the 20th century. They suddenly reappeared again in the year 2001. In 2002, they nested on lizards successfully, and uh, they've now spread far and wide in West Cornwall, and you can come upon them in the most unlikely places now. And there are about 200 birds in West Cornwall at this stage, so a great success story. Um, and I think it is very largely due to the fact that the, um, that the coastal 
grasslands are grazed by ponies and you've got this lovely short turf which is what they enjoy eating so um yeah in common with anglesey lizard is a good place to um, to see chubs uh, this one has obviously got lots of rings on it um and there was a quite an extensive ringing program to try and ring all of the birds that were reared on uh, Lizard and West Cornwall, but they've, they've stopped doing that now because there are just simply too many of them, um, which is a good reason. And plenty of these beasts as well, plenty of uh, ravens around the coast, things like peregrines and the usual cliff, uh, cliff species. Um, and I always think with all of the crow family actually, when you get to see them properly, they're surprisingly attractive. And even the raven, which perhaps has a somewhat um, ill reputation, is actually a, a beautiful thing when you see it close up. So um, this is kind of the sort of garden that you imagine uh, you might see in Cornwall, with lots of exotic species. So um, in the middle here, this echium is from Madeira. Uh, the plant here is from South Africa, this red thing. This is an acacia from somewhere in um, Africa, I believe. So you get the, um, the image of, of Cornwall as being um, a really mild place to live. And to an extent, that's true. But then this is the one of the corners in, in our garden. Um, but then that's the same corner in the, the uh, winter when we had the beast from the east with um, things looking not quite so um, subtropical. And um, we do from time to time, like everywhere else in Britain, have um, cold weather. And indeed uh, this year we, we had such a, well, the back end of last year, we had such a um, cold, cold period, nothing as bad as this, but, um, uh, but it was minus five during the day. And uh, uh, sorry, in, in the beast from the east, it was minus five during the day. And uh, this last winter, we've had temperatures down to minus three, which is not much in, in Britain, but um, it does uh, it does have an effect on flora and fauna. And of course, one of the exciting things that happens when you get uh, cold weather is that you get an influx of all sorts of birds. Um, and when we had the cold weather just before uh, Christmas, we suddenly had down in Lizard itself, um hundreds and hundreds of golden plovers turned up and they were cramming every single field down on the lizard there for um, a few days and then just as quickly they evaporated again and this rather innocuous looking puddle really i think much more than a puddle although we know it's great marsh uh, suddenly had 200 snipe uh, feeding on it and flying around and in great agitation for a few days and then just as suddenly uh, they're gone again back to wherever it was in Britain that they come from. And um, yeah, things like field fares, which we see coming through in good numbers most autumns, sort of late October, November, um, and then perhaps not at all from, from then on, uh, perhaps one or two places they might have a flock, but suddenly with cold weather you get lots of them turning up again. Um, so yeah, cold weather does happen and um, Cornwall can be an interesting place to go bird watching when that's the case. Through the winter as a whole, uh, the sea is good for divers. So the commonest species of diver down in Cornwall is the Great Northern, which by the sound of it is also true where you are. I'm fascinated by the different beak shapes that you get with Great Northern. So this one here has a particularly upturned beak and you might at first sight think, hmm, is that a white bill diver or isn't it? It isn't because um, it doesn't have the, um, the colour in the beak and, and it's, it, the beak isn't quite the right shape, but it kind of almost suggests that it, that it might be. Not something that I've ever seen down here as yet. Um, but we do have three other different divers down here. So we have um, red-throated, which is probably the least common of the commoner ones, if you see what I mean down here. They tend to occur later in the winter. In, in bigger numbers, but there's, there's a few of them around um, this year, this winter. Much lighter looking birds, slighter than Great Northern. Um, we have black-throated in reasonable numbers in certain places, and every year somewhere around South Cornwall there's at least one if not two Pacific divers. It's a speciality of Cornwall that we have uh, Pacific divers, but they're very similar to 
black throated and you have to be very careful in identifying identifying them and it's not something that i've seen as yet in lizard itself although they have been seen that's one of the few photographs in this presentation that's not taken on the lizard this is actually in newlyn which is just down the, the road from here near penzance uh, of a red-throated diver that um, hung around in Newlyn Harbour and uh, gave great opportunities for photography. Fine birds when you see them closely. Um, the orcs. So Guillemot and Razorbill, you can see in huge numbers passing the lizard almost any time of the year. Often, in fact, in autumn, they're nearly all Razorbills, surprisingly enough. You can see thousands of Razorbills in a day on lizard if you're if you get the right day and you spend enough time sitting on the point there. In March, we get a, quite a strong passage these days of puffins, although they tend to be so far out that you can only just identify them. And in winter, we seem increasingly to get this bird, which is black guillemot, um, which perhaps is uh, rather further south than most people would imagine you find them. But um, yeah, they, they do uh, seem to winter at least one or two every winter now, somewhere in the Falmouth Lizard. Uh, Penzance area. Occasionally interesting things turn up in winter. It's certainly by no means the, the place that you would expect to see snow buntings, but this one found its way onto a golf course and um, the golf team had obviously been sowing this particular tea with seed and um, it was the perfect place for a, a snow bunting and it spent weeks on this one golf tee eating all the seed that had been thrown down. Um, so he benefited from, from it anyway. The white-winged gulls we see in the harbours here, and so Coverack, which is on the east side of Lizard Peninsula, is one place where you can sometimes see either Glaucus or Iceland. This is an Iceland gull, a young one. Um, but this, not this year. We, haven't, we didn't see one at all in 2022, um, although one or two people did, but just passing through. Um, and the whole of this winter so far, there hasn't been one in on the lizard that you could just go and have a look at. But certainly down in in uh, Penzance, but but not not on lizard thus far. Although I suppose if we get more of these northerlies, they might start to turn up. So that's the same bird um, standing on the the seawall at Coverack. And this particular bird had a, a gammy left leg and you can see it's holding it slightly awkwardly. So um, you always knew when you, you, you'd see this particular individual. So Iceland gull is, is commoner here than, than Glaucus. You know, so we get to, um, to be fairly familiar with, with uh, Iceland gull, which has a relatively, um, it's relatively small compared to Glaucus and it doesn't have any of the ferocity of the um, the head and, and bill shape. So I remember in the, in the days when I was an inland birder in Northamptonshire, I would probably struggle to know whether I was looking at an Iceland gull or a Glaucus gull. But actually, once you are familiar with one or the other, they're so very different in their demeanour, um, the head shape, their beak shape and everything, that you don't even need to look for plumage characteristics. Um, that's an adult uh, Iceland gull that uh, was in the habit of um, feeding one of the sheep fields out on uh, out on the lizard point and um, I was just driving down to the point to, to do some uh, migrant watching one morning and this was just plodding around in the gateway so it seemed uh, only reasonable to take its photograph. Um, we have wintering cattle egrets which obviously is a relatively new thing. Uh, if you'd have said there were wintering cattle egrets in Britain 30 years ago you'd have been laughed at but the northeastern half of um, or quarter of the lizard always has at least one or two flocks of um, cattle egrets associated with the, uh, the dairy herds in, in that area. Um, and you can come upon them in lots of different places. Um, just occasionally a bit in winters. This one was Lupul a couple of years ago. And um, surprisingly, it was relatively easy to see. It used to come out and feed in the open on a little stream. And um, yeah, obviously, therefore, it was relatively easy to, uh, to photograph. Um, and then this time last year, 
suddenly there was a mixed flock of uh, tundra bean geese and Russian white fronted geese. So these are mainly um, the tundra bean geese. So these two here, for example, nice clean underparts here. This one here with the black barring is a an adult um, Russian white front. And so, we, but they're quite mobile, and you never knew where they were going to be next. But um, they were they were great to have for for a few weeks until they um, they disappeared again. But how on earth they found their way to Cornwall, uh, we'll never know. Black red start is. Um, well, they winter in small numbers, probably about the same as they do where you are, I suppose. So if you're along the um, the cliff tops, there's always um, it's always worth looking out for a black red start. And in the villages near the coast, like like Lizard Village, uh, there's always a possibility of finding a wintering black red start. Nearly always the female stroke immature birds, but just occasionally you get a, a really nice male hanging around. Um, but the winter population is is dwarfed by the number that we tend to see in spring and autumn, I have to say. But um, yeah, nice birds to have around. Firecrest, I heard you mention that in, in your report. Um, not very long ago, Firecrest was a nice autumn migrant find out on the lizard. These days, it is breeding in all of the fancy gardens that we have around Cornwall, certainly West Cornwall. Um, you can hear them singing when you go around places like Treba Gardens. Um, there are places on the lizard where you can hear them singing in the woods in the spring. And this little chappy was in my garden one morning. And indeed, they are regular in the garden at almost any time of the year at this point. So it's gone in the space of the six years that I've been living down here. It's gone from being a passage migrant with a modest winter population to being a resident, basically. And um, you can come upon them anywhere at any time at this point. Global warming, methinks, because obviously it's a sort of sub-Mediterranean species. Um, and I thought I'd show you this, which is, um, a sewage treatment works near Helston, one of the several sewage treatment works which are now important wintering places for wintering chiff chaffs. So there are 16 chiff chaffs on that fence, uh, and that would be by no means the total number of chiff chaffs at um, Helston sewage treatment works last winter. It's just the, um, the, the only ones I could get in the picture. Um, and amongst the um, common chip chaps, there are almost always in winter one or two um, Siberian chip chaps. So that is a Siberian chip chap. So the Siberian chip chap has um, almost pure white underparts, no, no suggestion of green or buff, uh, sorry, green or, um, or yellow, uh, just a hint of buff on the sides. The supercilium over the eye is really pure buffy white. Again, there's no yellow in it. And the bill and legs tend to be black or blackish. So as a comparison photograph, the bird on the left, slightly out of focus, is um, a Siberian chiffchaff. The bird on the right, which is in focus, is a common chiffchaff. So you have to be careful when you're identifying these things on, on, on site. So the one on the right, if you look at the supercilium, it's slightly yellowy compared to the one on the left. And the feet of the one on the, well, the legs of the one on the right are a, a wee bit browner than the one on the left. Um, but we're talking nuances here. And indeed, the, the back on the, the bird on the left is, is rather grayer than, than the one on the right. But um, so we spend a lot of our time looking at these things and wondering whether we have or haven't seen a Siberian shift chart. Um, the, for me, the clincher on site is actually the color of the ear coverts. So the color of the ear coverts on a Siberian shift chart are sort of tea colored and they sort of stand out. Whereas the, the ear coverts on a common shift chart, any common shift chart, are not but tea colored. They're more like the, the rest of the, um, plumage. 
And the, the, the absolute giveaway is if they call because the chiff chaff has that standard wheat call and the Siberian chiff chaff has a sort of ooh call, which is completely different. So if you can see the buffy colouring here, the tea coloured colouring here, there's no, no yellow in the supercilium and it's going ooh rather than wheat. You've got yourself um, a Siberian chiff chaff. And one of the um, local birders has spent quite a lot of effort in, in ringing these things uh, at the various sewage treatment works around West Cornwall. And the good news is that the Siberian chiffs are, chiff chaffs are getting commoner. They're now about one in 10 of the chiff chaffs at one, of, one or two of the uh, sewage treatment works. So um, they're, they're becoming regular. Um, and I believe they're about to become a separate species as well. At the moment, they're treated as subspecies, but it sounds as though there is growing evidence that actually they should be treated as a full species. Um, well, this is the um, boating lake in Helston, which has um, the advantage of being very easy to work. You can walk all the way around it and look at the gulls and look at the ducks. And the building with the green roof is a nice cafe where you can go and shelter if it pours with rain, which it did when I was down there a couple of days back. Um, you probably got the impression by now that I quite like cafes. This is, this is true. I always find it adds to my birding for no particular reason. Um, some of the things that you can see down there is good for taking photographs, obviously. So Mediterranean gull on the left uh, with the bright red beak and a, a distinctly rarer bird in South Cornwall the one on the right, which is a common gull. So that's a, a, a younger common gull on the right. Um, and that's a bird that I only see a few times a year, probably. Whereas Mediterranean gull, well, today, where was I today? Down at a place called Mainport, I probably saw 20 or 30 Mediterranean gulls and two common gulls. Um, for several years, and it's gone now, there was a resident Ferruginous duck, a nice, um, bright drake that um, turned up in the middle of summer uh, from nowhere and we've no idea where it came from um, but it was extremely tame and, and uh, living largely on on discarded bread I think um, and it never really as far as I can see moved away from from the um, from the spoting lake so my guess is that it probably didn't get there on its own and somebody probably put it there but why on earth somebody would do such a thing really remains a bit of a mystery. But then again, why a lot of people do a lot of what they do remains a mystery to me. So there we are. Um, so uh, two or three years back now, I just potted down there one morning and lo and behold, there was a Drake Lesser Scorp sitting on the lake. Um, at the time, Lesser Scorp wasn't on the rare rarities list for Britain. It's now gone back on again because the number of lesser scorps being seen in Britain has gone down significantly in recent years and it's now become a national rarity. But at the time, I didn't have to write a description of this bird, but um, it wouldn't have been difficult given the photographs that we were all able to get. So lesser scorp, telling lesser scorp and greater scorp. So first of all, there's all this lovely vermiculation on the side here, which um, is characteristic of lesser scorp. And then the head pattern is quite pointy on the top. And lo and behold, there's a greater scorp, which was in the same place this last um, last year, pure white on the flanks here, and a nice square looking head shape, completely different head shape, and it's bigger. Um, you probably can't tell from that, to be honest, but um, if you had them side by side, you'd notice that the, the greater scorp was significantly bulkier. Um, and then if you uh, are still in any doubt, if it opens its wings, it's um, very easy to tell greater scorp and less scorp. This is greater. It's got this white on the outside of the, um, the wing here, whereas if it was lesser, it wouldn't have that. It would have white here, but it wouldn't have any white here. So it's quite useful when they open their wings. Um, and then this last uh, few weeks, apparently it was back again yesterday. Um, it was around for a few days earlier in January, disappeared, came back again. We have no idea where it had gone, but this is a um, female ringneck duck. Um, 
Ringneck duck is a really bad name. It's one of those birds that should have been given a, a different name. And actually ring-billed duck would have been far better because it's got this really obvious white ring on, on the beak in both male and female. Um, but there we are. Um, Ring-billed ring duck seems to be um, a bird that is almost always somewhere in Cornwall at the moment, and often not one, but several. And a place called Sibleyback Reservoir is, um, seems to be particularly good for them. So whether or not we're going to get suddenly get, get breeding ring neck ducks in this country, I don't know, but um, I wouldn't bet against it. American birds by, by origin. So when winter ends, finally, um, and spring comes, we start to turn our attention to bushes and, and uh, meadows where we might find some rare spring migrants. And uh, this is one such place. This is um, Gunwallow Cove, which has a, a rather famous church where you can get married on the beach if that's what you want to do for a price. And it's surrounded by some bushes and it's a reasonably isolated. So it's a good place to, um, to have a look for, for spring migrants. And I was down there this last spring and there were a number of black red starts in the cemetery there including this gorgeous male in full breeding plumage um, knocking the spots off the uh, wintering birds completely great birds to see and in fact this was a very good year for them this spring there were several days when i had um, up to 10 birds in the morning Wheat ears are obviously one of the early signs that spring is coming. This year they seemed a bit late to me, but um, and you don't perhaps see so many in spring as you do in autumn, but the, obviously the great advantage of catching up with them in spring is that the males are in this gorgeous plumage on their way up to the breeding grounds. We have a few pairs that, that breed around the lizard, but um, uh, on the cliffs, but, but uh, not, not common. Uh, but in spring and autumn, given the right weather conditions, they can be pretty numerous, um, up to, I don't know, 20 in a field sometimes. Um, it's not that uncommon. One of the other rather nice features of spring for us is the number of wimbrel that come through in sort of April, May time. And these little flocks of them take up residence around the, the headlands and uh, in the pastures on the clifftops for a few weeks and then move off north and you hear that lovely call as they're flying around and uh, nice things to have. This was just a little party early one morning on um, Kennex Sands, which is on the east side of the peninsula. Let's try and get down there before the um, dog walkers, but it's <laughs> by no means easy. Even at six o'clock, there seem to be dog walkers out. And then just occasionally amongst the um, a wimbrel, you get a few Bartow Godwits coming in as well. Um, so that's a wimbrel here, look, showing its nice white crown stripe, a relatively small um, curved beak compared to a curlew. Now, it won't be um, difficult for you to spot that that's not taken on the Lizard Peninsula. Uh, this is on um, Fuerteventura, which uh, was mentioned earlier as a place that I regularly visit and have done since uh, early 1980s in fact and um, a bit like the chiff chaff picture which showed 16 chiff chaffs at Helston Sewage Works this actually shows 16 hoopos and I've counted them many times and they still come to 16 um, on a fence in La Oliva which is in the northern part of Puerto Ventura. Sadly when I was there this um, September, no, November, sorry, with my family. We didn't see one, which is a real shame. And um, I'm just hoping that they were all congregating somewhere that we didn't go to, but uh, I fear that they're not as common as they once were. But um, the reason for showing you this is that the hoopo is a, a annual visitor to um, a lizard. And uh, in fact, so this one is, is a picture of one on the lizard. And this one has an interesting story because we'd gone down to um, one of the headlands on the lizard to look for some serins that uh, a friend had found, which we saw. And I was standing next to one of my mates uh, looking out over the fields. And we were discussing where we might go and look for a hoopoe. 
because there had been several sighted in West Cornwall in the previous two or three days. And lo and behold, as I was asking him about where to go looking for a hoopo, I just thought, hang on, I can see one flying. And it flew in and landed on the roof in front of us. And um, there it was, a nice thing to see. Um, but yes, every every spring, I think now, I expect to see at least one hoopo somewhere on Lizard. And in fact, two years ago, there was one in Lizard Village that was singing for um, several weeks, um, first thing in the morning. So again, maybe they will breed one day, who knows? Um, another thing which we now get more than we used to is adult rosy starlings. So, so juvenile rosy starlings in the autumn is something that's been on the uh, menu of, of lizard birders for uh, many a year, but suddenly in uh, May time, we now expect almost, I think, to see several um, adult rose colored starlings. So uh, this was one in Lizard Village a couple of years back. Um, and another one, which um, standing here amongst the sheep fields and the foxgloves. And the foxglove is, is my key to finding adult rosy starlings. When the foxgloves are in full flower, I think, right, I'll go and find myself uh, a rosy starling. And most years it now works. If I spend a few hours um, hunting around, I can see at least one or two of these, these birds. Um, so again, one wonders as if in the not too distant future, rosy starlings might actually become a breeding bird in this country as well, which would be nice. Um, rarities turn up in spring. Those of you who know your warblers really well will spot from the length of this wing here, a really long primary projection that this is a marsh warbler which turned up in a hedge just outside Lizard Village a few years back, again in May, and um, singing away. And it's a fantastic bird to hear singing because it mimics everything. So uh, if only for two days, it was a great bird to, to have around. Woodchat Shrike, again, um, is something that you expect to see in the spring. Uh, several turn up every spring. And my own pet theory is that somewhere in Cornwall, uh, or who knows, it could even be Wales, some, somewhere in the west coast of Britain, I suspect Cornwall, there must be a breeding colony of, of woodchat shrikes that hasn't been discovered because they are without fail found on uh, the lizard in spring in, in good plumage and hanging around and then disappearing. Uh, after a couple of weeks so and then again they, they seem to appear as juveniles in the autumn so I could be completely wrong but I just have a feeling that maybe somewhere uh, there are woodchat shrikes breeding that we don't know about. There are certainly plenty of places in Cornwall that nobody ever goes bird watching so it wouldn't surprise me too much. Now uh, red kite now perhaps this is something that you see rather more of than we do. Red kite for us is a bird that turns up on nice northeasterly breezes in late April and during May. If you get a nice anticyclone with northeasterly winds blowing, you can guarantee that we'll start seeing red kites. So they don't breed in, in Cornwall as yet, and they're not here most of the year round, but suddenly we start seeing dozens, dozens and dozens of, of red kites in the sky. And they work their way all the way down to um, Land's End, realize they can't get anywhere, and then just as quickly they wander back up to um, central England again. Quite a phenomenon. Um, and I always see several birds from, from the house just by sitting in the garden and looking up when one of these um, periods of invasion, and that's probably what you could best describe it as invasion of, of red kites happens. Often they are in molt. So this one here, look, it's missing a couple of wing feathers. Most of them seem to be in molt when they come down. Uh, but yes, yeah, suddenly, and then suddenly they're gone again and we don't see any more, most of us. You get maybe the occasional one, but we tend not to see any more until April or May the next year again. Whether they will suddenly start to breed, I don't know. Apparently there was one pair that tried to, or looked as if it was trying to breed this year, but uh, it didn't happen. Um, yeah, so one day I was driving off down to um, Lizards over the heath and uh, this bird, was flying around and um, 
some of you will have worked out what it is, I suspect, but but it is in fact a Montague's Harrier. So um, hen harriers are relatively relatively common down here in winter. So there are, there are several birds seen uh, each winter. Montague's Harrier used to breed on lizard many years ago. It was one of the places that they nested. And in fact, on this particular down, I think they used to nest. Um, but long since, unfortunately, they disappeared as a Cornish breeding bird. And indeed, they're at risk, I think, of disappearing entirely as a British breeding bird by the sound of it. And they're in serious trouble in uh, many parts of Europe as well. Um, so this is, a, I think, a second year male. So it's got a greyish back. It's got some grey tail feathers. Um, small pale rump. And it was so delicate looking compared to, um, uh, to, a, to a hen harrier. And then with all these markings under the wing. Um, nice bird and a good one to see on the lizard these days. Um, Goonhilly Downs, this is perhaps somewhere that you've heard of recently. It was the satellite um, dishes were used to track the American moonshot recently and I think they will be involved going forward with the, um, the moon landing and all the rest of it. And this is just one of the pools out on the heath. There are quite a lot of these pools. 99 times out of 100, when you visit them, there's nothing there at all bird-wise. Um, and on this particular day, uh, taken a few weeks back, it's frozen over anyway. Um, but just occasionally, there is something there. So on this particular visit, there was a glossy ibis that had dropped in. And um, it was around for a few days. Uh, and then somewhat bizarrely, um, I was driving past there one, um, one day. A couple of years back and there was a black swan flying over the road in front of me um, out of nowhere and it pitched down on, on the, the pool here and stayed for um, for a few days before moving on again. Um, well and then summer what, what do we have breeding in summer? Well, sedge warblers are really common around parts of the um, peninsula, good numbers of those. White throats really common um, and we have Grasshopper warblers as well in, in a number of places. Um, probably, I don't know, maybe a dozen pairs around the around the lizard as a whole. Obviously, more often seen than heard, but on this particular occasion, I was lucky enough to, to get a photograph of one. Not something you very often see. Um, Lizard, as I mentioned earlier, is also extremely good for plants. And there are a number of plants which don't occur anywhere else in Britain. So this is one. This is the land quillwort, which is actually a type of fern, really difficult to find. But once you've found it um, in the right place, there are lots and lots of them. Uh, also very good for various betches. And, uh, and there are a number of species that are only found on, on the lizard. So it's a good diversion if you're a botanist it's in summer when the bird watching starts to get a bit duller. And just a few more examples. So this is um, lesser centauri, as opposed to the common centauri. Um, pennyroyal, which is a type of mint, which is only found in one place actually on lizard, in a horse paddock. And um, heath spotted orchid, which is a, a very common plant out on, on the heaths. This, this particular patch of heath spotted orchid, just after I finished photographing it, a cow came over and ate the lot. It was quite amazing. I didn't realise that they um, that they were interested in eating orchid flowers, but uh, once he'd had one, he certainly wasn't going to stop until he'd finished them. So um, that was a strange, slightly bizarre ending to a photographic session of orchids. Uh, and butterflies, so marsh retellaries are still found on, on the lizard in one or two places, and also small pearl bordered fritillary and um, dark green fritillary. So um, the habitat is good enough for, for a good range of insects, uh, including butterflies. Um, so one of the things I think that, that lizard is probably best known for amongst um, birders nationwide is sea watching. So I just wanted to take a bit of time to talk to you about um, sea watching on the lizard and obviously Sea watching is, is generally undertaken when, when there are storm conditions, uh, such as this. This is actually Kynance Cove, but um, it's, it's the right sort of day for, for doing some sea watching. And you mentioned, I think, a sighting of 
Manx Shearwater, this is Manx Shearwater. Um, and interestingly, we've noticed this winter there are far more Manx Shearwaters around than we would normally see in winter. So um, it isn't unusual at the moment to spend a couple of hours sea watching down on the lizard and see maybe 20 of these birds. Whereas normally at this time of the year, you would barely see one, uh, probably wouldn't see one until perhaps the end of February, early March. But this year, for whatever reason, there are Manx Shearwaters in our waters. Um, in spring, summer, you can see thousands of them passing, passing the um, peninsula quite close often. Also Balearic Shearwater, in, uh, particularly in the autumn, August, September, October time, we tend to see quite a lot of Balearic Shearwaters. Um, and then this bird, the Great Shearwater, which has this um, fine black cap, white collar, and then this interesting underwing pattern. Great Shearwater is normally a bird that we see on sea watches in July, late July and August, possibly early September. And some years there are a few, some years there are hundreds. And this year, for whatever reason, there were spectacular numbers. So I had a phone call from uh, one of the birders uh, midday back in, I think it was probably September, it might have been October, to say that there were thousands going past and uh, a number of us went down and, and watched this spectacle. And uh, John, in, in the course of five hours, I think counted about 11,000 great shearwaters going past, which I understand is a, a British record. And it was extraordinary. There were, when you looked out to sea from Lizard, there were great shearwaters going past as far as the eye could see. And um, not a moment when there weren't perhaps 10 or 20 in view. Uh, completely unique. And um, you do wonder what on earth's going on really when so many, uh, such a large proportion of the world populations is <laughs> going past in front of you. Um, and continuing the theme of odd things in winter, Great shearwaters have already been seen this winter. And indeed on, I think it was about the 6th or 7th of January when I was down on Lizard doing a couple of hours of sea watching, lo and behold, a great shearwater went past and other people have seen, seen them as well off Cornwall this winter. So it's unheard of. They are normally only found in these waters in uh, late summer, early autumn. And now it looks as though they may become something that we can see all year round. Um, so I think watch this space is the um, um, the right thing to say. Um, Corrie Shearwater, which is a bit like this, and rather difficult to identify at range, uh, they still seem to be sticking to the same pattern in that they're only being seen really in sort of late summer and early, early autumn and in much the same sort of numbers as we're used to be seeing them in. But Great Shearwater, something strange is going on. Um, storm petrels, you can see off lizard, although they tend to be rather distant. Um, identifiable if you get them close by the white flash on the underwing. And this bird, it, which is Wilson's petrel, has no white flash on the underwing and the legs are longer. I don't know if you can see the difference, but if the, that storm petrel put its legs up, they wouldn't go beyond the end of the tail. Whereas on Wilson's petrel, they do. And this is another bird that's being seen more and more in Cornwall and particularly off Lizard. I think the, the first record off Lizard was only a few years back. This summer between us, we probably saw 20, I think. Uh, so another bird, seabird that's increasing, undoubtedly. And there's Wilson's petrol from above showing pale flashes on the upper side rather than the underside. Different flight pattern. Um, and then I put this on Madeira and Petrol because lo and behold, when I was watching the great shearwaters going past uh, this autumn, suddenly this um, petrol behaving like nothing I'd ever seen before came in front of me. And um, it had long, thin, pointy wings, exactly as depicted here, but straight. And it was flying like shearwater. And um, from what I've understood from people that I've talked to with experience, that is exactly what Madeira petrels do. So and indeed that was the second of three that were seen off 
lizard this year and several were seen in other places as well. So again, um, it would appear that the deer, and or indeed what we're now supposed to call it is bandrunt petrol, I believe, appears to be something that is going to be seen increasingly often, presumably because waters are warmer, but um, who knows. Um, Grey phalarope is something that occasionally you can see on a sea watch from lizard, but it's so much nicer when it rocks up on Helston Boating Lake and you can take a picture of it at close range. So it's a grey phalarope because um, in particular the beak is relatively short for phalarope and relatively dumpy. And then this year, for the first time since the late 19th century, we had a redneck phalarope. Um, on the sea just below lizard life, the old lizard um, lifeboat house. And I think you can see the beak on this is much thinner and longer. Um, so that was a really good sighting. And it stuck around for long enough to, for all of the um, lizard birds to um, catch up with it, which is great. Um, autumn, autumn passage. One of the birds that I associate with autumn coming on is perhaps an odd choice, but it's Mediterranean gull. So um, one of the first things that happens in sort of late, late summer, really, is that we suddenly get a, an influx of juvenile Mediterranean gulls, like this one, um, drifting west around the coast and passing lizard. Um, not, a, not a day would go by when you were sitting out on the lizard when several juvenile med gulls didn't come past. And then autumn is obviously a time for looking for rare passage migrants um, in bushes. And this is one of my favorite places for looking for um, autumn migrants. And this again is Kynance Cove. So this is the aforementioned cafe here. And this little bunch of trees here and a little bit of tamarisk here and the stream uh, isolated by heathland and, and uh, barren grassland is um, a bit of a magnet for, for migrants, but it's very hit and miss, like, like many a migrant place. You can spend um, weeks looking in here and finding nothing more than a, a chip chaff, um, but, but it does produce. And over the last three years, um, I've found some good birds in there. So pipe flycatcher is something that um, I would expect to see in there from time to time in the autumn. Uh, this is red-breasted flycatcher, which um, is, is distinctly less common, but it's certainly annual or nearly annual on lizard. Uh, that, was, that was found in there a couple of years ago. Um, wood warbler, which is a rare bird down here in, in Cornwall, perhaps only one or two sightings a year. With this nice bright yellow, nice stripe and yellowy throat and upper breast, nice green pattern on the, on the wing. So that was in that bush um, last year, last autumn. And then this autumn, I found this bird in there, which is an icterine warbler. So melodious warbler is, is um, a commoner species here in autumn, but this had a long wing projection and pale patch here, uh, both very indicative and lovely blue legs, all very indicative of uh, icterine warbler. So that one bush really, has produced all those birds for me in, in the last four years, really. Um, another good migrant place is a place called Church Cove, which is on the east side of the um, Lizard Peninsula, just outside the village. So that's the bottom end of the cove. And then a bit higher up, there's a churchyard, which is quite a good place for seeing uh, various migrants, including yellow-browed warbler. There's never an autumn goes by without being one or two yellow-browed warblers in there. Um, and then one autumn we had this very handsome adult male red-breasted flycatcher which turned up. So nearly always red-breasted flycatchers in autumn are young birds, but on this occasion it was an, an adult male and um, it, stood, it stuck around into December didn't quite make it to Christmas. I think probably the um, lack of flies finally got it. But um, but yeah, it was there for two months and uh, it was really handsome. Um, yeah, again, this is the sort of place that we we lizard bird have spent hours and hours and hours wasting our time looking in all these bushes for, for migrants where you've got 
a lot of bushes, you can have a lot of birds, but they can be very difficult to find. Um, but nevertheless, over the, um, the space of an autumn, the sort of things that we, we turn up are things like ringers or on, on passage. Um, wind chats can be relatively common in uh, autumn, less so in spring, I think, but uh, in autumn, you can sometimes get quite good numbers of them coming through. Lots of wheat is obviously in juvenile plumage coming through. Um, again, pine flycatchers, not uncommon in uh, in the autumn period. Uh, it's a good place for rhinox. They they love the sort of combination of heath and um, and gorse and uh, tracks. And there are always rhinox in the autumn on the lizard from about the middle of August to perhaps the end of October, you can find rhinox. They're difficult to find, but they're always there. And I think probably what happens is that they come across from Scandinavia through Eastern England. They work their way down to Cornwall, to these particular places that they know are going to be good uh, places to spend the autumn. And they live down here, I think, for weeks on end and then when it gets time to move on to um, Africa, off they go. But um, you can find them any day in, in autumn, irrespective of the weather. It can be um, a week full of westerlies and you go out on a nice day and there's a rhinoc if you know where to look. But secretive and uh, easy to, uh, to overlook. Uh, juvenile redback strike. Redback strikes are, I think, probably annual in the autumn. Um, yeah, I think so. Red star, mm, not an easy bird to see on lizard, but um, a few every year. And then another phenomenon which seems to have, have um, started to occur, it doesn't happen every year, but uh, certainly in some autumns now, we suddenly get an influx of white stalks, uh, which may seem odd, but these are the white stalks from the reintroduction program in Sussex. And they do pretty much what the kites do. They come down to uh, Cornwall find that there's no way to go anywhere further than Land's End and come back again. And um, not, not infrequently, there's a small flock of them ends up circling around Lizard trying to work out whether they can get further south and realising that they can't and going away again. But uh, even though they're, they're not wild, it's a, it's a fine thing to, to suddenly find flying about over you. So as autumn progresses, we tend to get more yellow brow warblers turning up. Um, and then towards the end of the autumn, if you're lucky, we also get palaces warbler with the nice whitish stripe down the top of the head, distinguishing, distinguishing it from yellow browed and this sort of bright yellow patch in front of the eye. Handsome birds, um, not a great picture, but this is dusky warbler, which occurs most autumns and sometimes winters uh, in the willow scrub and whatever. And a couple of years ago, I was lucky enough to find this rads warbler near Cadgeworth. Uh, one of the birds had heard something that he wasn't sure what it was. And I went down there first thing the next morning and lo and behold, a rads warbler popped out. And um, I followed it through the hedge for about 20 minutes. A couple of other birds managed to come and see it. And that was it, it disappeared off into Cadgeworth village and was never seen again. But um, great, great bird to come upon. So in comparison to most warblers, quite a stubby beak. Uh, and actually you can't see them very well here, but it's got quite stocky legs as well. So um, yeah, a good bird to find, definitely. Um, great white egret is not particularly common down here yet. Um, I was motoring past Goon Hilly Downs one, um, one day this autumn and there was a flock of swans coming across the road so I thought well I'll pull over and just check whether they're mute swans or something more interesting. Uh, so I got out of the car and looked at the, to my disbelief they weren't six swans they were six great white egrets and um, luckily for me they pitched down in the field next to where I parked the car for about half an hour and they were off back east again. But uh, yeah, a sudden a surprise, a sort of surprise that you get when you, if you go out birding a lot, you'll suddenly get something surprising happening. Woodcock come to Cornwall to um, winter 
in big numbers. We don't, they don't breed here, but they winter with us. And ringing has shown that they don't come over the North Sea like the birds that you'd see in Norfolk. They come along the um, French coast and up across the channel. And uh, certainly there can be quite a lot coming in if the wind conditions are just right in late October, early November. And sadly, this one had just, um, just arrived from France and got knocked over by a car, uh, which was very sad. But um, yeah, there are a lot suddenly. And then perhaps you don't see any more until the following autumn because they've nestled down into a wood somewhere and um, they mind their own business. Difficult to find. Autumn, uh, late autumn, influx of skylarks happens. Um, and at the same time, you tend to get various pipits turning up, which can be interesting. This is a tree pipit, which um, is in a tree, which is always a good start, but obviously identified very easily by call, rather less easily by, um, by, by visual. Uh, but you can hear them flying over lizard um, many days in autumn. It seems to be a bit of a, a funnel for their migration. Uh, this isn't a great picture, apologies, but this is a Richard's pipit. Richard's pipits are, I think, annual on the lizard now, um, mainly in autumn sometimes in spring, but they do also winter with us. Um, not easy to find in winter, but that almost always there are, there are some richest pipits about. And to prove the point, I um, set out uh, between Christmas and New Year this was, I thought, do you know what, I'll go out and find myself a richest pipit. And I parked down, down here, this big car park at Gunwallow, and I was going to walk up this hill to um, some rough fields where which I thought might be suitable for Richard's pipit and by the time I just got to about there about five five minutes walk from the car I could hear one flying over me and it flew over landed down on this headland here and before I could get over there it had gone off again over the marsh but um, there you are there was a Richard's pipit clearly wintering because that was uh, the last week in December and as I say every every winter somebody finds one or two somewhere so they clearly are wintering with us Rock pipit, which I call Kynance sparrows, because if you get down to the cafe at Kynance, there are no sparrows, but these things come looking for bread from you. So uh, this is my Kynance sparrow. Quite a dull coloured bird, but um, quite um, charismatic, I think. Um, and then two years ago, we had its close relative, the buff-bellied pipit, turned up in the field. And um, yeah, they're not that easy to identify by sight, but they have a plain back. If you look at the rock pipit, it's still got some streaking. This is plain, and it does indeed have a buff belly under here. Uh, and there are others, some other differences, paler legs. And again, a distinctive call when it's flying around. You think, what on earth is that? It's so different to um, any other pipit that you could hear. So um, yeah, a, a, a American land bird um, turning up on the lizard. So that's, that's a good bird for us. And then occasionally you get something that really stumps you. And I came upon this bird in a field with a whole load of medipipits a few winters back and took some photographs. And I wasn't sure whether I was looking at a medipipit or a red-throated pipit. So I asked around a few people, showed them the photographs. Nobody really seemed to know whether they thought it was one or the other. Um, and so I thought, well, do you know what? I'll send the photographs to Killian Milani who I vaguely know, and ask his opinion. And he um, came back with all sorts of reasons why it was actually definitely a meadow pipit, uh, which I would never have um, been able to find from any book that I've got. Uh, but there you are, that's the advantage of expertise. And the clincher apparently was on the inner side of the um, scapulas here. It doesn't have a white fringe. Now, who knew that? <laughs> I certainly didn't. Uh, it was an aberrant meadow pipit. Uh, this is just a late autumn uh, yellow white tail looking a bit like an eastern, but not an eastern. Um, it's a good place for migrant moths as well. So this is crimson speckled moth, which seems to be occurring more regularly. Uh, it's a Mediterranean species. There are lots of other moths. I'm not, not a moth expert, but for those who do like moth trapping, the lizard is great for migrant uh, and vagrant moths. Um, just finishing off with some of the rarer things that have been seen recently. 
So this is at Stythians. Um, Stythians this year was almost empty. We had severe droughts, as I'm sure you did as well. It's pretty, it's pretty full now, but um, for the whole of the summer, there was a lot of exposed mud, which of course is great for things like ring plover. So suddenly there were flocks of these things flying around. Um, and from time to time, you get American vagrants. So for example, this um, pectoral sandpiper turned up a few years back. Um, getting to the extreme rarities now. Now there are two extreme rarities on this photograph. One is obvious, um, even if the identification isn't. So this is a brown shrike that turned up in one of the valleys. The other rarity is actually this white flower. And this is Cornish heath, which is rare in Britain, but it's actually all over lizards. So another example of a plant that you can only see on, on the lizard. Um, this was a bird that exercised us this autumn. We, it was first identified as a hen harrier by a visiting bird watcher who sent around some rather fuzzy photographs. From the fuzzy photographs and the dark head on these fuzzy photographs, we thought we might be looking at a northern area, which is the, um, the American version of hen harrier, if you like. Uh, and then when we saw it properly, we could see it only had um, four primary feathers sticking out rather than five, that eliminates both hen harrier and northern harrier. So we knew we were looking at either a Montagues or a pallid harrier. And that's where things got very tricky. But ultimately, we've submitted, well, I've submitted it uh, as a pallid harrier on the basis of the fact that the underwing is almost completely white, which would never be the case for any plumage of Montagues as far as I can work out. So, um, so yeah, if we, we think we had a pallid harrier and we'll see with, whether the rarities committee agree with us. Wouldn't be the first for the lizard anyway, but um, that's a good bird to see. Well, one of the um, great things about birding on the lizard is the camaraderie. So there's a bunch of about a dozen of us who um, were all old fogies, I'm afraid, and all male, as you can see from this picture. But um, it's nice to share this uh, wonderful part of Britain with others. And every autumn, sorry, every um, Christmas, we get together for a celebratory meal and discuss what we'd like to see the next year and what we enjoyed about the year that has just gone. And one of the things that we do each um, uh, December is to award the Booby Prize, which and the, the name will become more obvious to, to you as, as I tell you about this. Uh, which we present to the person who found best bird of the year. And we've had this for four years now. So I just want to run you through the rare birds that have been voted the best bird over the last four years. So in reverse order, starting this year, we had Siberian stone chat, very pale looking individual, which was found in the middle of the Lizard Peninsula in a place where you wouldn't really think a rare bird would turn up. So this year it's Siberian stone chat. The year before it was, and I don't know if any of you came down for it, but we had Rufus bush chat, uh, which Dougie Wright found when he was out walking uh, for a picnic. And uh, this put pay a bit to his picnic really, because um, it was a stunning bird and just sat in the ditch and um, everybody who came got fantastic views of it. And um, yeah, what an amazing find that was. So that clearly won the year before. Um, there's another picture of it doing its tail up thing. I was, when this news of this thing came out, I was right at the other end of Lizard Peninsula, uh, many miles from the road with my wife. And um, it took me the best part of an hour and a half to get to the place where the Rufus Bush Church had been found. And I was getting increasingly anxious about seeing it, um, but see it I did. And um, yeah, it was a great experience, but it was only there for two or three days. The year before that, it was the red breasted flycatcher that I mentioned earlier on. That was a quiet year for rarities and this um, little beauty won the prize. And then the year before that, and the reason why it's called the booby prize is that uh, four years ago, I was lucky enough when looking for wheat ears to um, suddenly notice this strange bird flying around over the bay and lo and behold it was Britain's third ever brown booby and uh, hence the booby prize. 
and uh, this goes down as one of the great days in my life having found such a rare bird and indeed correctly identifying it because it would have been a bit sad if I got it wrong and that's just a picture from the notes that I took to um, try and persuade the rarities committee although it didn't really have much of a job on my hands because it was seen by thousands of birders I suspect and that's just a picture of it being watched by some of the people who came down to, um, to have a look at it. So that's birding on the lizard. I just wanted to end on one last um, positive, and uh, it's not a great photograph, but what this bird is, is a female cell bunting. And what's happened here is that um, the cell bunting has been introduced to the Roseland Peninsula, which is immediately to the east of uh, Falmer. So the next peninsula back up the, towards um, England, as we call it. Um, and um, the, the, some of the local birds started seeing cell buntings on our side, on the lizard side of, um, of the fowl. And so we thought we would set up a feeding station to um, try and encourage them through the, uh, through the winter when stubble can be a bit difficult to get hold of. And lo and behold, uh, we put this in somebody's garden out on. Let's come uh, back up to me on this site and, and they started to um, they started to come in and, and feed in front yes, of this he is. kitchen window um, and lo and behold we've now persuaded these birds to breed to the west of Falmouth for the first time in in decades and I just hope that um, this is perhaps going to be another success story in the years to come if we can keep the process going so that is um, all about the birds of the lizard and uh, I hope you did, enjoyed that and look forward to answering any questions you might have. Brilliant well th thank you very much David that was uh, that was a brilliant trip around the lizard um, and I mean we, we have a tendency we, we have a tendency in North Wales to sort of go to the east coast quite a bit in October but uh, um, it does show what your part of the Cornwall does get, um, you know, throughout the years, especially in the autumn. And uh, quite interesting about the Rhinex, how how you know you've obviously got a good density of those uh, in in the autumn. Uh, something to to go looking for. Um, unfortunately, um, me, me and Martin, uh, we, we came down for your booby, uh, but being oh. uh, being uh, weekend bird twitchers, um, we 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 missed it. Um, so I don't. I, I don't know what happened. Did, did it have a stroke in the night and die? Because uh, I thought it was almost a um, almost a dead cert, you know, because it had gone roost to roost there. But um, um, you know, what, what a find! And 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 I went back with the family this year to enjoy Kynan's Cove again because it's I, I think it's just one of the most beautiful places in in yeah. the UK, which is is brilliant. So, uh, and, yeah. and does anyone else have any any questions uh, for David? If that's okay. Before, before anybody does, can I just fill you in a bit on the finding of that booby? Because uh, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. It's an extraordinary process because um, well, we we'd just been looking at a red back strike, and um, there were four of us there, and we sort of went off in in different directions looking for various things. And I said, well, I'll go and find a rare wheat here, and I got about two hundred yards, I suppose, when uh, this thing was circling around in the bay. And um, I just thought, oh my God, that's a juvenile brown booby. Um, no phone signal. So I ran up to the car to, um, to, to well, first of all, to get the telescope. So I thought I'd better be sure about this before I put it out. So I ran up to the car, got the scope out the back, kept, ran back down, it was still there, got the scope on it, thought, yes, that's definitely a brown booby. Ran back up to the car to try and get a signal. And um, the only person I could find on, on the signal was Tony Blunden, who lives in the village itself. And he said, oh, blimey, OK, I'll put the news out. And of course, Tony Blunden has a house up on the top of uh, a hill in Lizard, which is about a mile and a half from where I was seeing the booby. Uh, so he got his Swarovski telescope out and he spotted it because um, it had disappeared again by the time I got down to the to the um, to the cliffs and he spotted it in Kynan's Cove which is probably two and a half miles from his house sitting on a rock um, it, it, it might have been one of those birds that one person saw and didn't get through the rarities committee but because Tony managed to find this thing sitting on a rock 
uh, where it sat for the next several days, um, apart from occasional excursions over the, um, the bay where I'd seen it. Uh, it, it, might, it might never have um, it might never have made the, the grade sort of thing. So it was a bizarre find, uh, made even bizarrer by the fact that quite a lot of Britain's top twitchers at that, that very day were in St Ives Bay trying to find the one that had gone missing from there. And my assumption was that this must have been the bird from St Ives Bay, but actually it wasn't. It was a different bird with a different coloured beak. So for the rest of the morning, there were all these twitchers from uh, St Ives Bay running up to me and congratulating me, shaking me by the hand, patting me on the back and all the rest of it. And it was a right old hoot, basically. So, But yeah, it, it was there for about four days, did a bit of fishing, and then I think just moved on. Simple as that. Probably realised it was, it was in completely the wrong place. <laughs> Brilliant find, though. Well done. Yeah. Anyone else got any questions? Uh, yes, David, uh, could I ask you about you, the Manx Shearwaters? I, I must have actually missed exactly the timing. The Manx Shearwaters that you see in some numbers while sea watching, what's their origin? Is that, is that just, was it passage migrants or, or, or have you got breeding populations near enough for it to be feeding movements? Right, yeah. So, so the, the birds that we see streaming past the headland all summer are, I would imagine, birds that are breeding places like Grasshone um, and may, maybe um, beyond, because obviously they cover big distances. So, yeah. um, for sure, in in the early part of the year when they're still arriving, they probably are birds coming up from the south. And similarly, in the, sometimes in the autumn, they're probably birds going back south. But in the middle of summer, when we're seeing thousands of them, they must be feeding flocks that are coming Sweet. from uh, the Welsh Welsh colonies, I would think. Welsh yeah. colonies, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We don't yeah, have thanks. any breeding here at all. Yeah. No. Unfortunately. So, yeah. Certainly. I mean, they, they move remarkable distances and some of the tracking stuff that's been done from uh, Bardsey and um, Skokoma or Skoma have shown them going right up uh, so far north in Scotland that really the lizard is relatively handy for grass home, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Same with gannets. I mean, we have gannets streaming past here all summer as well, and it's the same thing. It's either uh, from the colonies in South Wales or indeed um, northern France, I think because we don't have any yeah. gallic colonies anywhere near here either. But clearly yeah. we have lots of fish. Yeah. D David, um, you, you said that the chuffs arrived in 2001 and bred in 2002. Yeah. W w was it Irish birds that um, sort of that arrived that led to the Cornish re-establishment? I think from memory that's right, although I, ca I can't 100% remember, but I think it was Irish birds. Um, or it might have been Brittany. I, I honestly can't remember. I'm pretty sure it wasn't Welsh, oddly. Uh, I, th I think I think you're right in saying that it was that it was yeah, Irish. I yeah, I think that is the case. So and they it's turned up in the year when um, it was the um, what was that animal disease that we had? Foot and mouth. Foot and mouth. Yeah, it's foot and mouth. So so people couldn't walk along the cliff tops which was a bit of a bonus because um, it meant that the disturbance to the chubs, their first breeding attempt was was minimal, I think. And that may have played a part very fortuitously. It may, may have played a part in them being able to establish. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, most of them, to be fair, breed in sea caves where you'd have to be a pretty good um, climber to get to them. But even so, it's just people hanging around in the places where they're trying to feed, I guess, that are a problem. And um, as those of you who've been to Kynats Cove, for example, will know, I mean, Kynats Cove is a great place to be chubbed. But uh, in summer, it is incredibly busy with people. So, uh, yeah, that is still an issue. But um, despite all, they're doing incredibly well. Yeah. David, I, firstly, r r incredible talk and great set of, set of photographs to help illustrate it. I mean, one of the phenomena you, you, you talked about was actually the... Um, um, the um, arrival of seabirds that are not expected, the, the, the likes of Madeira and Petrel, the um, 
the wintering actually great shear waters. And you know, there's been quite a lot of reports about things like the um, bluefin tuna being far more common. Yeah, uh, I mean, you said it was climatic change, but is it is it you know what's the theory behind what's happening? Is it, is it are there noticeable noticeable increases in, in temperatures of seawater or? I, do you know what I, I I wouldn't be um I wouldn't be able to answer that. I mean, I I'm, I'm just picking up on um suggestions that are being made by various people. Well, what I do know is that th there is obviously a change in in what we're seeing and the overwintering Manx water is another good example. Mm -hmm. um, there is something different, whether it's available, well, it must be availability of food, I guess, but, but what is producing that availability of food is, is another question. I mean, certainly you mentioned bluefin tuna, and certainly in my six years of living here, the bluefin tuna in Cornwall has gone from something that you almost never heard about to something that you see off Lizard Point on a regular basis through through the summer uh, and into the autumn. You can hardly do a sea watch without seeing bluefin tuna leaping out of the sea. Now, bluefin tuna um, feed on mackerel and things like that. And they, they herd them, I think, um, by sort of congregating around them and pushing them up to the surface. Now, whether that makes them easier to catch for things like gannets, maybe it does, but... Um, I don't, I don't think that sort of thing would explain the, um, the increase in sightings of certain shearwaters or petrels. Is the Manx shearwater a recent phenomenon? Um, well, no, the, the, the passage through, through the year is, is, is perfectly um, well established. The wintry ones, the wintry ones I was thinking of. Wintering's a bit unusual, yeah. Mm. How, how, I mean, how many years has that been going on for? Well, to be honest, I mean, this this January seeing twenty on a sea watch is is um, probably unheard of. Yeah. So, so it's, it's very recent. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a similar. I mean, we, we we occasionally have December records, but it's the first one I've heard of, and I think it was the first one Ken Croft, who has been birding on the island for about fifty odd years, has, has ever had in January. So it was quite out of the ordinary, yeah. out of the ordinary yeah. to have that. I mean, just to continue the theme, I mean, um, sooty shear water is being seen this month as well, you know, off various mm. headlands. Um, and again, I've seen two or three in a couple of hours sea watching of those, which is unheard of as well, really. I mean, yes, every now and again, somebody would normally see the odd sooty shear water off, off Cornwall in January, February or March. But to almost be able to guarantee to go down there in the right conditions, and see one within an hour is is something completely new. So. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. I can't. It's in control. That's my problem. Yeah. Is has anyone else got any questions for David at all? We haven't got any questions in the chat, but what we have got was um, Rachel saying what a fantastic talk with so many identification tips and some botany and she thanks you very much because she's learned so much and Julian said the chuff origins were Ireland. Excellent okay well if um, if no one else has got any questions I'll hand over to Ian right now uh, and Ian will give the vote of thanks to David. Ian. Thanks, Steve. Uh, yes, David, thank you so much indeed for a most enjoyable evening. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed that talk from beginning to end. Um, there are all sorts of reasons, perhaps, why I enjoyed it. Um, some years ago, in the late 70s, I was posted to RNS Cold Rose from Valley here and oh. um, spent a couple of years at, um, uh, at, on, on the Lizard living in Helston and a fascinating area it, it always was. I uh, was not an active bird watcher at the time. Family and, and work really kept me uh, clear of that sort of thing. Thoroughly enjoyed uh, being there, and it was a real delight to revisit it uh, today. And what was obvious as a, a, an Anglesey resident at the time when I left, how like Anglesey, the whole lizard area 
potentially was. In your talk today, you brought out quite a lot of the uh, comparisons and similarities with uh, Anglesey that exist. Um, even even the names around the lizard have a have a hint of the Celtic link to uh, well the Welsh language uh, uh, as well. I noticed one of yeah. the things, of course, you you started off with was the, the chuff and how nice to see them back. Of course, there was no sign of chuff when I was there in the seventies, but they were, of course, around us uh, here in Anglesey, and I uh, I was really interested by your comments of the the way the coastal heathland were grazed by ponies and i really think that is a quite an important uh factor in helping the chuffs and i know that although work has been done on anglesey to uh, encourage grazing on the coastal heathland the coastal fringe um it it's not really they're not really winning on that one and um, i'm not sure that we've got any uh, grazing ponies, it might be a lesson that could be uh, learned for Anglesey there. So that uh, that was great to, great to see. Um, Black Guillemot, again, I noticed, of course, Anglesey for a long time has been the most southerly breeding point of, uh, of the Black Guillemot uh, population of the, the UK, but um, they are creeping south all the time, uh, I, now I know, and it was interesting to see, and, and perhaps um, your anticipation that maybe seeing regular winter visitors might uh, lead on to some breeding uh, birds down there. Uh, what, a, what a delight for gardeners in uh, in uh, Cornwall if they're uh, in uh, the lizard if they're uh, getting um, uh, firecrests nesting regularly. What a what a fantastic addition! And if that is climate change that's uh, leading towards that happening. Um, that, is, uh, that is a great deal of fortune um, for, the, uh, for the lizard uh, people. Um, chiff chaffs, fascinating that you have so many uh, wintering chiff chaffs. And, um, and, and just to, uh, uh, to repeat uh, Rachel's uh, thanks in terms of ID features, there are a great number of ID features that you were able to include in your talk when you were talking with the birds, which I'm sure a lot of people who were listening tonight were, were uh, appreciated having those pointed out to them, reminded those are the things they need to look at. So thanks for that. Uh, that that uh, was great. Flocks of Wimble reminded me, of course, of Anglesey again, marvellous. Rosy Starlings, <laughs> I've got a little... I, a little personal, not not a directly personal story about Rosie Starling on the lizard while I was working at Coldrose. A colleague had to go into the airfield on a Sunday morning for something. And uh, on Monday morning when he saw me at work, he said, oh, Ian, he said, I saw a really interesting thing on Sunday morning. He said there was a flock of starlings on the uh, on the airfield. And he said, and one of them had forgotten to take a nighty off. She was pink from, uh, and I just thought that description of having forgotten to take her nighty off was absolutely marvellous in relation to what was clearly a rosy starling that he as a non-birder had uh, spotted amongst the starlings on the, uh, uh, on the airfield. Um, so, um, wood chat. Uh, I think it's a great theory, <laughs> and uh, I do hope it turns out actually to be be the case that lurking somewhere in one of those marvelous deep valley woodlands that lurk in the uh, around the edges of the lizard that uh, um, there could be woodchats uh, breeding uh, as well. Absolutely fantastic. Um, what I really enjoyed, and I'm sure other people would appreciate as well, was how you related the birds that you were seeing on the lizard both with the timing not just of the year but um the regularity of certain things and also the weather related things this i think is a a, a fascinating and um important aspect and um ken croft who uh, was the the guy who just seen the manx shearwater locally that martin referred to ken very long term birder this is one of the keys he knows what's 
likely to be there on timing and weather and knows exactly where to be. And uh, and you pointed out to us, I'm sure, that that's uh, that what keeps you spotting these good birds there as well. Um, anyway, uh, it, it was a thoroughly enjoyable trip down to the Lizard. Uh, as you say, uh, travel from Cornwall to Anglesey, which I uh, discovered, of course, when I was posted down there and my family was still up here. Travel between Cornwall and Anglesey, not at all easy. So there's one of the benefits of Zoom, as uh, as Steve says. And it was marvellous to have you um, talking in such detail, not just about the birds, but about the other flora and fauna uh, on the lizard and the fascinating place that it is. Thank you very much indeed for a, a most enjoyable talk this evening and best luck with the cell buntings. Thank Thanks. you very much. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you.